Hi, everybody. So uh, they're controlling us. Uh, thanks for staying here and not going to the library. I promise that this will be uh, the <laughs> most exciting session of the day. Um, I will do whatever it takes to make this uh, memorable. Um, so uh, what we're going to do as a, as a first gesture uh, towards that uh, noble objective of uh, entertainment uh, is we are going to dispense with opening statements. I'm not going to tell you anybody's bios. You can look them up. Uh, we are just going to plunge right into uh, the conversation. So the topic here um, is privacy, big data, and the internet. Um, and I'll just say, uh, uh, to betray already my own comments, maybe a few sentences uh, to just situate the, the starting point for this conversation. So um, broadly speaking, in today's dialogue, uh, you can detect uh, these two kind of broad, central axes of conflict that animate the policy space around technology and uh, the internet these days. One axis is the conflict between uh, censorship and freedom of speech. Uh, uh, the other axis is around surveillance and privacy. And broadly speaking, uh, the debates that we've been having today fall along one of those two axes. Uh, going down one level, there are two sort of like animating themes that uh, define the nature and the scope of the fights uh, that are taking place on those issues. One uh, is the fact that we've got a cross-border global network uh, in a world where rulemaking still happens as a function of territorially bounded national governments. The nation states make the rules, the internet blitzes across them, and that uh, creates one of the fundamental tensions that lies underneath these debates. Um, the, uh, the second one is that the rule makers are governments, um, but the owners oper and operators of the infrastructure are private sector actors. So we have often, though not always, democratic mechanisms by which the rules are determined, but the actors that actually control the communications and the flows of information that are in question are uh, privately held and often cross-border, subject to the jurisdiction of many national actors um, in the case of our largest corporations. So these then are the two great axes of conflict, the two great complicating forces that, uh, that, that um, uh, make this interesting. Um, and the particular focus that we're going to um, uh, uh, apply in this panel is around the implications of the dramatically cheaper computing resources that we, we often call cloud computing um, uh, that benefit from the often oversimplified and misunderstood but nevertheless quite powerful Moore's Law, uh, which means that computing gets cheaper and faster every year. Um, and, uh, 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 and that gives us big data. So big data is data that is so numerous in its volume, so varied in its form types and file types, um, and so speedy in the uh, uh, analytics that can be performed on it um, that it goes way beyond the capacity of any single database uh, and requires the kinds of massive computing infrastructures that Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and other companies are now in the business of, pro of providing. So that's the big data part of it. Privacy part of it is that big data uh, uh, crosses the line from a thing that we can sort of like easily manage and comprehend through single actors to a phenomenon that has to be managed or regulated or contended with because of its uh, ability to uh, de-anonymize, sorry, anonymize and then de-anonymize anonymized data. So when uh, anonymization becomes a very practical problem, uh, the data has entered the realm of big data. So um, uh, uh, those are sort of the um, positioning situational sort of starting points for our conversation. And with that, I'm going to start with uh, Nula on my far left. So. Um, you spend a lot of time talking to actual policymakers, people in the executive branch and in, in Capitol Hill, about the um, uh, uh, balances that surround privacy as an issue. Um, your organization, CDT, has traditionally been a sort of convening point for policymaking with a public interest orientation, but a practical sensibility. Um, your own background spans public interest organizations, government, and the private sector. So you're the perfect person to start us off on the conversation. What are uh, you talking to policymakers about right now in the privacy area, as it relates to big data anyway? What are the possibilities for legislative and other kinds of action? Is any needed? Where is the conversation in DC? Okay, that's about six questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely to be here. Um, you already sent out a paper. 
paper on this on this panel. Um, they've covered all of the ground that we're going to cover today. And I'm just I was reading at the obituary section of the New York Times. I love the fact that I'm here in New York reading a paper copy of the New York Times. I haven't read it on paper in how many years. Number one, I want to note that CDC was mentioned in the editorial page today. I'm very proud of this. Thank you very much for our work on cybersecurity and national security. But um, William Zinsler, who's the author of On Writing Well, has anyone read On Writing Well? It's right up there with Chuck and White. Mm. Yep. Those of you who love writing. Said, dispense with jargon, right? Big data, first of all, is just jargon. Big data is just a lot of little data put together. I always remind people that that is, it's a, kind of an ephemeral and a, amorphous concept that is just a lot of data. What we're talking about at CBT, obviously, is the concern about the personal data, the data of the individual, and not just the ubiquitous collection of data by governments and by private sector, but the decision making that comes from that data. So the, the slogan I always say is it's not just the data, it's the decision. We're worried about the disparate impact on individuals by the embedded algorithms that are going to determine our lives in our devices, in the walls of our buildings, in our cars, in our homes, in our schools. We are concerned about, again, the use of the data for opaque decision making that profoundly affects your lives, whether it's in the decisions about not just advertising that is sent to you, frankly, I'm kind of past online behavioral advertising, but about the content of your experience online and about the opportunities you are given, whether it's as for education or content about you know, mortgage loans or any kind of opportunity in the economic space, in the commercial space, in the, in the human knowledge space, we're concerned about the use of data about you in an opaque manner. Is there a need for legislation? I don't think there's a need for legislation any more about big data than I think there is about data generally in this country, and I think there is a need for kind of omnibus legislation. I, I've said that since the time I was at General Electric or at Amazon, that settling the playing field and creating clarity of rules for good corporate actors as well as for the, the consumer, the citizen, is certainly necessary. We're an outlier in the global dialogue on data protection and privacy, as we, as we all know. And, and so big data as part of the larger conversation around data and decision making in this country Absolutely. But I think people get caught up with the jargon big data like they did eGov or you know, Y2K or whatever the hot thing was all the years we've been working in, 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 uh, in the internet space. I think it's more about the affect and the effect on the individual in the years. All right, so let me ask you about, um, let, me, let me press you on two things. So CDT, as I understand it, has uh, advanced for years now a position that the U.S. could use baseline privacy legislation that would cut across all sectors, all collections of data, all uses of data. Is that, is that still true? So the U.S. traditionally has had these kind of like siloed laws, right? Specific sectoral laws, right? So specific laws that apply to financial data, educational data. Is it still the case, by the way, that the single most protected thing about me as an American citizen is my videotape rental records? Well, it's certainly what we call the Yes, probably. Probably, yeah. Through, Thanks to uh, Robert Bork, I guess. <laughs> so, and again, it's very much informed by my time at the great General Electric Company, of which I see some representation here, um, that I saw industries converging, right? The data about your healthcare experience is converging with the data about your commercial experience, is converging with your online behavior, and no longer can we really segregate and argue for the sectoral approach. Mozell Thompson, were you at the commissioner's conference where I gave the 55 minute speech? explaining the sectoral approach and was almost booed off the stage by the other commissioners, right? I'm done giving that speech. It's just not tenable. In a world where, again, our data is going to be both ubiquitous and also free-flowing, and I don't want to be deterred and, and, and giving up hope that we should have data limitation and, 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 uh, and uh, more closely held you know, and more closely guarded limitations on what data is collected. But as we fully engage in a digital life, in the digital world, more and more data will become available and, and, and perhaps given to companies freely by ourselves. We want to see clear baseline rules that really allow for clarity for the individual and control for the individual. And so I think as, as industries converge, you cannot segregate this data by industry approach. So um, one more question, and uh, then I'll let you catch your breath for a second. So. Um, one of the uh, things I argued in the piece that I wrote yesterday as a background to this panel is that the conversation in DC now, now appears to have shifted uh, kind of comprehensively away from the notion of um, uh, collection restrictions and is putting all of the emphasis on use restrictions. Um, and in particular, I was quite sort of taken uh, 
taken aback because it would be too strong a term, but it was, uh, you know, it was very striking to me how the PCAS, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology Report, is just absolutely definitive on this point, that the benefits of uh, uh, big data uh, in health and transportation, education, and so forth, they're just so profound. The convenience and the utility that's unlocked by um, unfettered collection of data is just so enormous that we would be fools to let these kind of penumbral, isolated sorts of problems on the margins um, cause us to limit data collection as a sort of prophylaxis against abuse uh, later. Um, what's your take on that? Do you, do you concur? Uh, no. Uh, so I am Don Quixote-like in my adherence to the belief that data limitation is, is, is a better path forward, and it's informed by my time in the federal government. Because not assuming that all of our data is going to end up in the hands of the government, but knowing that right now much of it does, regardless of the commercial nature or the one-to-one -one nature of the transaction in which I'm engaged, I would rather see thoughtful limitations on data that is collected about me in the transactions in which I, again, freely engage online or in the digital world, at least that it is germane to or reasonably anticipated to be germane to the transaction at hand. That's not to say that I don't believe I should be able to do whatever I want on Facebook or do whatever I want on LinkedIn or, or search for whatever I want on Google. What I want to know is that there's a legitimate kind of basis for the collection of that data that is somewhat relevant to the transaction at hand. Um, so no, I don't believe in kind of, we should all just let it all go because the Internet of Things is so great and we should all believe, yes, there are great, great potential and great big societal big swings that can be solved by, by data and by, by technology and healthcare and education and the environment. This is all true. But to simply say we should just let it all hang out, that's, I don't think that's the solution. I think the solution is more intelligent adherence to fair information principles and more creative solutions around what the basic fair information principles look like, and that means notice and choice and disclosure. Some of the devices I worked on at Amazon, again, we, we had conversations about should there be flashing lights when the, the, the device is collecting data? Should the, the, should the lights go this way or should they go that way? Should they be red? Should they be blue? It does not have to be language written on a screen or privacy policies. I've written more privacy policies that more people have not read in this country and others. Um, it does not have to be language based. It could be, you know, iconic. It could be graphic. It could be lights and sounds. But there are ways to let people know that data is being collected about them. And that the onus is on the great technology companies that are creating these devices and, and new technologies to help create an ecosystem where the individual is aware of the transaction that is happening, the, the data that is being collected, and can engage in and choose to engage in that world when they want to. So Matthew, let me turn to you next. You're, um, I've been getting familiar with your work over the last uh, couple of weeks since you agreed to do this panel. Um, and it's uh, super interesting. You're, you're a, a historian of science and technology, and you've been um, writing about some pretty lengthy time periods, actually, in the history of surveillance and the history of um, computing. Um, one of the things that, that struck me um, about the, the kind of the unfolding nature of the debate in DC, um, and in Europe right now too, is that there are these um, little discussed, but uh, I think very significant kind of historical um, uh, narratives that seem to underpin a lot of the, the uh, current um, uh, arguments about privacy. So in Europe, of course, this is quite obvious, the history of um, uh, communist regimes in Eastern Europe and, and uh, uh, the Stasi, for example, in East Germany, um, and their uh, kind of meticulous uh, 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 record keeping of the most intimate details of people's lives, the uh, creation of literal dossiers that um, often sound um, analogous to many uh, Germans, at least, to the kinds of profiles that online advertising companies, search engines, social networks, and so forth um, compile about their users. Um, that seems to power uh, part of the debate. Um, in the US, there's the example um, that uh, 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 was new but very striking to me about um, Congress's deliberate act uh, to lift the restrictions on the 1940 census data in order to facilitate the identification of Japanese Americans in order to round them up and put them into internment camps um, is an example of the betrayal of a purported use restriction uh, when it becomes inconvenient uh, uh, for the government. Um, and so uh, it's fascinating to me that there are these sort of like historical antecedents that we either forget, um, ignore, or in some cases I think maybe overread um, when applying them to um, uh, the current uh, potential of big data, uh, the kinds of restrictions and limitations that might be applied to data collection and use. Um, can you comment on sort of what the history teaches you and, and, and the, the narrative that, um, that you draw out of it? 
Yeah, so um, thank you. I, one of the most striking things I've discovered when I started doing some of the history of what's going on with the NSA is this sort of remarkable conversation that's happening in the late 90s, which is all about the historical necessity of a transformation in surveillance. That is a movement towards both an expansion of foreign surveillance, but also the need for domestic surveillance. So there's this amazing document, which someone FOIA'd years ago, um, hasn't gotten much comment. And it says, you know, know that we will uh, follow the Fourth Amendment, but senior policymakers need to understand that the information age is gonna require a different understanding of domestic intelligence. That the presence of foreign communications on the internet means that the Fourth Amendment isn't going to be able to be interpreted the way it has been. And what I um, discovered is that this was part of a much larger discussion among a variety of people, um, mostly in DC, but also Rand, Stanford, and elsewhere, which was about, it was a, it's what historians call historical uh, technological determinism. The technology was demanding policy choices. And one of those policy choices was going to have to be domestic and domestic surveillance. And this conversation, um, it was quite striking because it even said we're going to be living in a post-Westphalian age. We were just talking about the Westphalian order. But it was explicitly that we no longer could have convenient divides between law enforcement and foreign intelligence. That, the, that we necessarily are going to have this and privacy was going to have to go with it. And so I think um, historical narratives of the necessity of change are rather important. We find a very a simpler one in you know that kind of overdetermined uh, accounts of privacy that Mark Zuckerberg and others have often given that undergird, not only is it that we would be losing out by restricting data, but we'd simply be working against a flood. Um, and so I think what's really important is to acknowledge the power of these kind of narratives and then ask where are they deceiving us about real policy choices? What sort of conflations are they making? And often the conflations are ones that are central to this conversation conflations around uh, things that worked well in an earlier telecommunications domain and then get expanded to another. So for example, the idea of uh, moving from, uh, you know, using a, 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 using a, you know, getting one phone number on one particular line and then saying that can be expanded to bulk collection because there's no ex nihilo creation of a, is, is an account that comes out of a particular historical uh, vision uh, of transformation. So you, you reject the baseline uh, notion of technological determinism that underlies that, that argued shift, is that right? Well, what I would say is undoubtedly the question, it's un unquestionable that you have transformations in technology that make laws obsolete, but that those technologies do not cause particular laws to emerge. Those come out of choices of discussions of the kinds we've been talking about all day. But then they often get covered up by narratives that stress their inevitability. And this is true both, I mean, if we just think about the notion of consent, the idea of consenting to say the sort of things that are associated with Gmail or Facebook, or the notion of consent that's built into um, uh, national security uh, decisions like Smith versus Maryland, that that should extend to consent to bulk surveillance. That's a very problematic sort of notion. All right, that's a perfect transition to Rebecca, whose <laughs> uh, most recent book, um, which I, I, I say uh, in full disclosure, uh, we're friends going back many years, but um, is easily one of the best uh, four or five tech policy books of the last two decades, is called uh, Consent of the Network. Um, and... <laughs> 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 she brought product. I didn't, I didn't even know that. Um, so Rebecca, so um, so you are also um, on record rejecting technological determinism as a, as a as a as a rationale for um, the kinds of censorship and surveillance policies that we've seen emerging around the world. Your book ranges quite widely. You've studied a lot of different countries. Um, you've lived in uh, China um, as a CNN bureau chief there. Um, you have built. Uh, one of the most interesting um, kind of bottoms up uh, uh, news reporting sites called uh, Global Voices Online. Um, and you've captured in your book a lot of the um, 
sort of conundrum that confronts people that are trying to figure out how to protect privacy. So can you expand on why, uh, in your own work, you um, have taken such a, I don't know, such a sort of forceful line against policies that flow from some notion that the technology dictates it? And then, um, you know, the tailing question is like, um, where do you stand on debates about the regulation of big data? Sure. So, thank you for the plug. <laughs> uh, I would say that the book came out uh, two years before the Snowden revelations, and if I had the time and resources, I would have gone on a I told you so tour. Um, but uh, <laughs> in any case, um, the, so technological determinism that, that I, in, in the sense that I rail against it in, in, in my book, um, has to do with, I think, the, the magical thinking that a lot of people engage in, that the internet is just naturally going to make us freer and more democratic. You just have to spread more, more internet into those unfree places and they will magically become free over time because the internet is the internet. Um, and I'm, I'm daughter of a, of a professor of history. I've spent time in China. I used to study Soviet studies, it was called. I know something about historical determinism in the Marxist sense. Um, and, you know, generally, if, if you assume a particular outcome, you know, sort of better outcome is going to eventually emerge just kind of magically because technology and history is, is just automatically going to take us there, that absolves the individual of responsibility. It absolves companies of responsibility. You know, we saw, I think, um, just to draw a very concrete example, 10 years ago when Yahoo was revealed to have handed over user information of a Chinese uh, journalist, dissident journalist, uh, to the government, one of the defenses Yahoo gave at the time, and they've, they've, they've become much more sophisticated since then, but at the time, the defense was basically, but we're bringing the internet to China, so in the long run, we're doing more good than bad. You know, they didn't put it in this, these words, but the message was, you know, this guy's the collateral damage of us freeing China in the long run because we're bringing the internet there. You know, that, that, that is very kind of common thinking. And so my, my book, sort of stem from a frustration that, look, you know, the, the trends in Western democracies around surveillance, um, uh, less in the United States, but much more in other democracies, censorship is growing, that you can't assume that just because we're in the, in the internet age, we're gonna have a freer and open society. People have to make very conscious choices on the policy level, on the corporate level, in terms of the design of technologies. You know, we've been talking about this all day, but, you know, particularly when I started writing the book, it was, not something that people were thinking about. I think it was just a, all we need is open government and open data and open, open, and everybody will be free and happy, happy and shiny, shiny. And that that's been kind of the magical technological deterministic thinking. And, and, and I think, unfortunately, if you, if you look at kind of what happened in Russia and the euphoria around the internet in Russia and the blogosphere and now what's, now basically how, how the Russian government has co-opted um, the, the internet uh, in, in a much deeper way than a few years ago. You, you look at the trends in China, uh, commerce is growing, the internet is growing, freedom no, is not growing in China. You know, it, it, it's, it, the internet does not equal freedom unless you work, work really hard to ensure that the global internet can actually be compatible with the kind of society we want to have. Now you asked me another, you wanted me to address another question um, I think it Which was, was so about, like so 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 bringing the arguments yeah. of your book into a debate about that big into, data and, and, and post privacy, Snowden sort yeah, of like revelations and, and about and the extension as of surveillance. Well, I actually want to um, riff on something that Brad Smith said earlier when um, he he said you know perhaps we need to reframe reframe this you know is the problem we're trying to solve for privacy or is it trust? And the problem is is people are feeling betrayed. They're feeling betrayed by their governments, so they're feeling betrayed by companies that sell their stuff to other companies without them understanding what's happening. They feel betrayed by companies that hand their stuff over to governments. You know, there's, there's just a complete lack of trust. And if we want this global network to have value, um, we do need to find ways to restore trust. And governments obviously have a responsibility to do that if they want 
this network to be of value you know, for for the reasons governments are supposed to exist, and uh, if if and companies, if they want this network to be a value for them commercially, have an obligation to proactively disclose, you know, be transparent about what you're collecting, be honest with your users. You know, companies are starting to be more transparent about government requests, issuing transparency reports. You know, but with commercial data collection or how they're enforcing their terms of service, the transparency is absolutely awful. What's being sold to third parties? What's being collected from third parties? And I've got a project right now where we're beginning in the fall going to produce our first kind of ranking of a number of companies where we're going to be comparing companies' policies and, and practices, not only in how they're handling surveillance demands and kind of human rights challenges in the classic sense, but are they being honest and transparent with their users um, about what they're collecting, what they're sharing with whom, and so on? And do they have you know, decent security practices, and are they kind of showing any proof of that? And this is basic stuff that companies, you know, even the, the kind of easiest low-hanging fruit, the things that companies could do to help to ensure there's a baseline of trust in this network, they're not doing, and unfortunately, we're all going to pay the price over time. And governments, of course, are, are also not living up to responsibilities in terms of abusing the network for surveillance purposes, kind of short term. We have a problem that, um, you know, you talk about the decline of the Westphalian system. You know, you, you have governments setting up policies and practices that might make sense within the context of the one nation state, but of course what they're doing affects users all over the world, and those people have no say in what that government is doing. And you know, we don't have mechanisms to ensure you know, human rights impact assessments for the global internet of a policy of a particular government, and we need to start figuring out how to do that. We need to figure out the, the right mechanisms for accountability the, the, the right mechanisms for risk assessment that will actually enable the global network to be something that people can trust, and we're not doing a good job. All right, Mike Nelson, your first job um, in politics was working for a kind of obscure Tennessee senator who had a uh, seat and I think eventually a subcommittee chairmanship on science and technology. You um, were intimately involved in the legislation that gave rise to the commercial internet, as we now know it. Um, you uh, followed him into the White House. Uh, you worked at IBM. You've worked at Microsoft. Um, you're now at a sort of upstart uh, internet infrastructure company. But so you've been on both different sides of the corporate government divide. You've also been, you've got roots going back to the days of, you know, when the internet was BitNet and NSFNet and ARPANET and TimeNet. It wasn't really the network that we know now. So let me ask you sort of two questions. One is, um, uh, uh, are you surprised by kind of like where we've ended up, uh, you know, having, having sort of worked on it for that long that, you know, in 2015 the big debates are about kind of mass scale surveillance of huge numbers of uh, people in, in very intimate ways. Um, and the internet now being sort of at least as much a suspect force for manipulation and uh, narrative telling as it is for free speech and kind of human empowerment. That's question number one. And question number two is, um, can you take us it down into the debate in DC right now, um, sort of where I started with Nula, which is like, so, sort of what conversations are you having around big data? What actually seems feasible? Um, let's get into the nitty gritty of the politics around big data right now. Two very easy questions. <laughs> um, I helped Al Gore organize the very first Senate hearing about the internet in 1988. Oh, so uh, it was you who invented You invented. I helped him commercialize <laughs> the internet. <laughs> we did invite the people who invented the internet to the hearing in 1988, which is what Al Gore was talking about when he was misquoted. But the, the fact <laughs> is, in 1988, we did this hearing, about 100,000 people were using the internet, almost the whole world of internet was university researchers. Nobody showed up to the hearing. Everybody thought Gore was a flake. Within about five years, he was a visionary, which on Capitol Hill is almost as bad. <laughs> but if you go back and read the hearing transcript, you can see that the people we invited had a pretty clear picture of how the internet was gonna evolve over the next 20 years, 
in terms of its capability. We could see that we were going to go from 4,000 bits per second to 2 megabits to 10 megabits. We could see that we were going to have 3D graphics. We could understand that there was going to be this flood of entertainment and a huge amount of data being collected about all the things that people were doing online. The thing we could not anticipate, of course, is eBay, Craigslist, LOL Cats, uh, eHarmony, and all the ways that that capability would be used. But there were people talking about the potential dark side, even back in 1988. Even back then, you had the scary Orwellian future where everything was connected and everybody was watching everybody. Had Mark Rodenberg graduated from law school by then? He, 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 was, he, he was there a few years after <laughs> that hearing. Um, what's more interesting for me is what uh, David Brin wrote in 1998. Uh, he wrote The Transparent Society, which was this visionary book about how we might get away from the Orwellian future. Uh, his hypothesis in 1988 was that by 2015, everything would be online, webcams would cost 10 cents or $10, would have infinite bandwidth, and he, he argued that we really would have only two choices. We would have 1984, where the government knows everything about everything you do, and you don't know what the government knows. Or you would have the transparent society, where everybody knows everything about everybody. And policemen have body cameras, and you can track what the companies are tracking about yourself. I mean, it was a really a radical idea at the time. It was the most controversial uh, he wrote an article for Wired Magazine about the book, and it was the most controversial article ever written in Wired. Thousands of people wrote to, to say he was crazy. I think that's partly where we're headed. And, and if we make the right choices, particularly about freedom of information and about forcing governments to be more transparent, ensuring that companies have a, a virtuous cycle that leads to more competition to be more transparent, I think we can actually get to a world where people have a sense that they know what data is being collected about them. They actually have ac more access to it, so they can use their own data for all sorts of reasons, and they can know how it's being used. Oh, we come have on. The, this, give me, this is, give this me is, one this, trend, one thing that makes me th would make me think that's going to happen. A a Amazon can tell me everything that I've purchased. I, I'm very happy to trust Amazon because I know. Does what Amazon they know. tell you everything you've ever looked at? Probably not. Probably she not. knows. Let me jump in here. So, uh, <laughs> just today, Fortune Magazine rated Amazon the number one most trusted brand in the world. It, it, I'm sorry. Congratulations. Yeah, I don't work there anymore. <laughs> I don't know anymore. But you laid the foundation. <laughs> well, my title was VP of Customer Trust, back to Rebecca's <laughs> comment. So, that, you know, for the brief shining moment that I was in. Um, you're absolutely I, I, I agree with what you said. Mike and I agreed we were going to mix things up, actually, before the panel, because we, we just have fun that way. Um, I agree with everything you said, except I don't think those are the only two choices. I, if I well, had to choose I, between I, I, those two, I'll go with the latter. But I would, I would choose a third course, which is transparency and accountability for institutions, but a sense of personal space that has boundaries that I get to define, the digital self, you've heard me say this a million times, where my self-expression online, my, my interactions online, my transactions with commercial, with corporate, with individuals, with institutions, are ones that I control and I get some dignity from and some rights in. The commercial interests have rights in that data as well to do what they want within reasons and within some boundaries. Um, but you're right, Rebecca, it's a, it is about trust, and, and there has been a loss of trust, certainly in the US government, for example, in the global dialogue around data. Um, but I, so I, I would trend towards transparency, but with a little more control for the individual. Another example, though, is my own company. Cloudflare has been around for about five years. Uh, we are now handling 10% of all the web requests every day. So. Two million websites are protected by our technology and our infrastructure. We have very simple privacy policy. We're, we're, we're assuring our customers that we're not going to let governments put monitoring devices in our networks. We're not going to hand over data about them unless we have full legal requirements on paper and, and it's the subpoena that's valid. Uh, we've made very clear that we're going to use that data for one big purpose, which is to understand where the threats are on the web so that we can better protect the two million websites that we protect. Have you received national security letters that forbid you from disclosing that you've received them? We have a very interesting transparency report that I wrote <laughs> that says, 
a number of things that we have not had to do. And you can read through that and infer whether we have had to do that or not. It's a good answer, them, actually. Very one one because well, this, is, this is called the this is called the canary. This is the you. new this is the new thing that uh, a number of companies like ourselves are doing, which is you say as as we're you not ever we're, we have we have not done this 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 and this, and every every six months you can check to see if that list has changed. But the other thing that I was going to say about this is this is an example of where we have to push back against governments that are making it harder for us to be transparent. Uh, we have a report that we put out, and we are not allowed to say anything more than we have responded to between zero and 999 requests for information from the U.S. government. That's not very reassuring to our customers. I mean, it would be much, would much more it would be much more reassuring if we could give a number and actually tell people that of the two million customers we have, only X have been affected by any government request. But you are able to say, because I think you just said it, that you have not and will not install standing monitoring equipment in your network infrastructure. And I guess there's nothing in the law that will, would require that. Right? When companies Not do yet. that, it's because they're asked to and they find it either more convenient to or they've been appealed, their patriotism has been appealed to or something like that. But it's not because they've been required to. Mm -hmm. Not in the United States. Not in the United States. Do you I have mean, infrastructure is, outside this, the U.S.? We have 40 data centers around the world. How can you then say that you would not? We, we, that's what we've said. So do you do and, like and a we risk would pull assessment? We choose where the we're putting our yeah. data centers according would to how we Would you pull infrastructure can, out of a country that required you to violate that policy? We haven't had to I guess face that yet. Because the CEO would have to make that decision. We haven't decision. faced that problem yet. We are not in Russia, for instance. Um, but the, to, ask, to ask your other question, the other question, to answer your other question, which is what's, what are the hot topics for us in Washington? Uh, I actually spend a lot of my time watching Europe. We, there, Cloudflare hired two public policy people in January. We're both based in Washington, but we're One's from my old team at Google. Yes, yeah. Heather West. Nice work. She's great. She is wonderful. And it, it's, uh, it's going to take two of us to figure out how to protect us from crazy regulations which are popping up all around the world. But one of the things that we're seeing is, is, is this, these laws in Australia, in France, all these new requirements for companies, mostly ISPs, to collect data about their customers. But the other thing we're seeing, and this is very alarming, is more and more rhetoric that implies that ISPs, social media companies, uh, infrastructure companies like Cloudflare should somehow monitor all their customers we are the deputies. You know, it's our job to make sure that some 14-year-old wannabe jihadist in Wisconsin gets detected and is kicked off of Twitter, for instance. Uh, you hear senators and congressmen saying, this looks like aiding and abetting the terrorists, even if it's just some crazy person in a basement somewhere saying that they love ISIS. And this is, this is really alarming, because it, it, it com runs completely counter to the law that enabled the internet to grow so fast over the last 20 years, so, which is the law that said in internet infrastructure companies are not liable for what their customers do. They have to respond if someone, if the police come to them and say, there's illegal activity here, help us out. But they can't be in a position of having to censor and monitor every customer. We provide protection to most of our customers for free. If we had to vet each customer, and then monitor what they wrote and did, we couldn't do that for free. And right, so millions, let me, let me, millions of websites would be unprotected. Let me, let me, let me, let me drill down on this, and then I'm going to shift topics uh, in just a second. But let, let's drill down on this one for a second. So um, uh, you, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, I think CDT used to say that the Magna Carta of the Internet is intermediary yeah, immunity. CDT. Like this bizarre surviving clause of the yeah. Communications Decency Act called Section 230 Ron Wyden is a saint. Yeah, the one freestanding sort of provision, which, by the way, I was involved in the CDT thing at the time, was you know, the brainchild of CDT. Um, so, so that Magna Carta says that the people just move the bits are not responsible for anything other than moving the bits. And it is under assault basically 24-7, right, in every country. Uh, even in the U.S., where I, I noticed in one of the ICANN-related hearings uh, yes. uh, last week that, you know, the, um, the kind of uh, usual um, cohort of copyright maximalists and IP extremists, you know, have descended upon 
um, ICANN, as, as they always you know, or do every couple of years, to say, you need to be um, taking action through the domain name system to prevent uh, you know, fraud, copyright, uh, infringement, uh, counterfeiting, and so forth. But it's a classic, well-intentioned effort to try to make the infrastructure do something it's not very well configured to do. But so one of the things that, um, that, that the big American internet companies, and I think the small ones too, have, have assumed is that the trigger for complying with somebody else's laws is either people or infrastructure. Like if you move into a country in some physical way, you are bound uh, to its laws. And if you don't, then um, you know, the network of MLATs and letters rogatory and whatever else, that's how countries will enforce their jurisdiction, if at all. Um, and so uh, uh, just like you said, you make these very deliberate decisions about what goes in. What I think has been interesting has been the um, effort of companies to have it both ways. It's to have like some people in China, like some developers or you know salespeople, but we're going to keep our infrastructure you know elsewhere. We won't put personal data into the country, um, and, and that seems. I mean, to me, that's like sort of an interesting, but ultimately doomed you know sort of like strategy for for dealing with this. Um, uh, anyway, my question on this one, and, and, and then I, I will shift gears, is, um, you know, big data basically says, like, you have huge numbers of data inputs go into databases, and you produce outputs in the form of products or analysis. Um, uh, is it um, the case that in this sort of globally interconnected world, we can draw those kinds of fine distinctions based on physical location, based on uh, geography, based on... Um, infrastructure um, that will allow the regulation of data being collected, or is it essentially hopeless because whatever you know, effort the US government makes to regulate, there's always going to be a, you know, an Argentina-based company with no infrastructure anywhere else that will just you know, do the thing that we would not like to see? It's going to be very hard to track where a particular customer is coming from, particularly with people being so mobile, generating data in five countries in four days, it's very hard to see how you apply different privacy regimes to each place they go. And it's, so if you're and it's really, and it's really, and it's really, I think, going to be hard. We have a, a, one of the things you didn't mention in your introduction is the fundamental collision between the bonanza of big data and the 35-year-old OECD privacy principles that say data will be collected for one purpose and used only for one purpose. The bonanza of big data is predicated on the fact that you're going to find some other way to put data together in a totally unexpected way that's going to have a huge benefit for the customer. I don't like the term big data, by the way. The term should be biff mud, big, fast, fat, missy, unstructured, Distributed data. Hmm. That's what's new. Good luck with good, good luck with that branding. I, uh, I've been trying for two years. See if you get anywhere. But with the that. last point is the key one: is the distributed. I mean, that's what's really different so, but about so big data. Any, and, and having 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 data coming from seven different countries, or in our case, twenty-five different countries, pulling that data together and creating a database that we can use to protect two million websites more effectively is going to be very hard if we have laws that say German data stays in Germany, Argentine data stays in Argentina, or if there are different privacy regimes and different rights and responsibilities so, that we have to meet in each place. So Nula or, and or Rebecca, when you counsel policymakers and they're asking you, like, what, to, what do you tell them? So they're confronting this landscape where basically the sort of prevailing wisdom, and it seems to be the reality, is your efforts to try to control this are going to be unavailing. Even if you do it, uh, you know, in your own legislation, it being, you know, let's say, uh, collection restrictions or something like that, you're not, as a practical matter, actually going to be able to uh, control what what uh, is happening to your citizens online. Like, what do you tell them? You want to start? 
just like you, you, uh, ahead. you know you don't say that out loud to them right they're going to kick you out of their offices um I, no i'm i'm the the, the short-term pessimist and the long-term optimist on this right this has been a dialogue that's been happening since there was a data protection directive since there were the oecd principles we will move to, towards a world of global interoperable standards eventually when after we try everything else and get it wrong right <laughs> so and, and rebecca waved at me and said trade agreements and you're absolutely right i mean yeah. someone said to me terrifyingly the other day all this great work you're doing in data protection laws and trying to create harmonization and 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 Accords between different regions can be wiped out with one pen, you know, in, in a trade agreement, which was a lovely and charming thought from a trade negotiator. Um, we will get there, and in the meantime, the companies will race ahead and do what they want, right? And 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 frankly, are innovating and creating, you know, cross-border data flows, and the regulators will struggle to, to catch up. But but they will get there eventually, and in the, and and in the meantime. You know, right now Europe is setting the standard for what global companies are doing, and, and co companies that are doing business in multi jurisdictions will go to the high, good ones will go to the highest standard and protect everyone to that level because it's easier for one system to set one set of, of boundaries and, and standards. So, I, you know, I do think the U.S. needs to, to catch up and simplify, frankly. So, our counsel to U.S. lawmakers is a simpler, cohesive standard will be not only easier to sell globally, but will create certainty in the market for U.S. based multinationals. And to, to add to that, I mean, part of the problem with policy making and law making, you know, in most of the developed world anyway, is that people are solving for a specific problem in their jurisdiction. At that their time, constituencies today. are demand that their constituents are demanding them to solve, um, and you know, and and solving for that rather than thinking about how is this affecting kind of globally, what are the long term impacts. How does this interconnect with other issues? How might it contradict other policies, et cetera, et cetera? Which, which is why I think actually the work of the commission and, and work of sort of various global efforts of, of different kinds uh, to try and set norms and standards for policy making are, are so important because because you know, lawmakers and policymakers need somebody to say, look, you need to kind of step above whatever the immediate problem for your jurisdiction is, and you really have to do an impact assessment on kind of what this means for other things that your not only your constituents, but you know, the, the, if this is an internet policy making issue, you know, how is, how this is going to affect internet users globally? You actually need to do an impact assessment. And Carolina Rossini, I don't know if she's in the room. Um, from public knowledge was talking about how there's an effort to develop sort of impact assessment processes for, for national level policy making so that it doesn't mess up the kind of global internet uh, in the process. You know, so, so you can have sort of more coordin principled coordination. You know, or when you're thinking through, okay, is this trade agreement actually going to increase intermediary liability, which is going to make it even harder to, to, for, for companies to actually defend their users' rights, right? And, but that's what's happening. I, on intermediary liability, I want to point people to one particular resource. Um, there's something called the Manila Principles on Intermediary Liability that was just released, uh, I guess it was in March, and Brett there from Access kind of helped provide a, a platform for this, but a group of NGOs from all around the world and, and legal scholars, and I think CDT was involved and, and, and many others, came together and put together a set of principles for intermediary liability and limiting intermediary liability in order to ensure that policy making around intermediaries is consistent with human rights principles. And you know, so the idea is to provide some guidelines to policymakers that, okay, if you're setting these policies affecting internet intermediaries, here's some things you want to keep in mind if you don't want to mess up the thing for everybody around the world, assuming you care about human rights around the world, which if you're in a democratic legislature, you have to at least pretend to do, right? <laughs> um, and uh, so, and, and there's you know, the 13 principles on, on surveillance, you know, they call better, otherwise known as the necessary and proportionate principles that are also trying to kind of set human rights compatible norms for democratic governments that are trying to balance law enforcement national security needs you know with how do we respect human rights on the internet and enable companies to respect human rights on the internet um, but it's it's very hard to get lawmakers policymakers to to pay attention to so that that's a, I'm, I, I, I really like that document too because it's an attempt to be principled and pragmatic at the same time yeah. um, which I think is very cool all right I want to shift gears 
hit one more topic, and then we'll see if anybody in the, uh, uh, in the crowd wants to wade in. Um, and I'm going to start with, with you, Matthew. So, so one of the, and this is kind of stepping back just a little bit, one of the, um, one of the great anxieties that um, you hear articulated about the age of big data and the surveillance processing profiling and so forth that it makes possible um, is the idea that, um, that uh, we are killing off the kind of zone of, um, uh, zone for mutation uh, of human beings. In other words, people's ability to um, explore unpopular ideas, um, play around with their identity, um, uh, figure out who they are through reading things that their local community would be mortified to know they were reading, um, communicating with people, the, the sort of canonical gay or lesbian teenager in you know, rural Wyoming that uh, 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 would be able to find a community online. But in an era of pervasive surveillance, or the fear of it anyway, and the kind of like uh, data gathering storage and analytic capabilities that big data makes possible, that people will be reluctant to do that. And we'll have this kind of like increasing um, conformity, uh, even online, which was supposed to be kind of, you know, uh, and has been a place where you can find niche communities and um, um, uh, explore ideas that are uh, disfavored in your immediate geographic locale. Um, do you buy that? Does that ring true to you? Is that something to be concerned about? Um, and if so, what do we do about it? I mean, I think one of the challenges there is that a lot of the promise that um, the sort of analytic technologies associated with big data are precisely to allow people to be uh, in, in the tiny part of the tail. That is to provide the conditions under which something like a recommender engine might give you a, f a false positive, but might have recognized a little bit of signal that suggests things that are resources for you. That is, that it provides the opportunity to look at people outside the sort of normal social categories. And the Obama administration claimed to do this in the last presidential campaign. We're not slicing and dicing according to sociology. Um, and, and so there's an argument that it, that it that these technologies are precisely enabling of certain kinds of the, the, the of an autonomous self, um, and I think those are important. The problem is when those technologies are coupled to pervasive surveillance of various kinds, that it excludes precisely that that kind of autonomous activity. So the question then becomes: under what conditions? Perhaps we're not thinking of it right as being sort of, you know, uh, pervasive data collection versus privacy but rather that that access is entirely wrong. That um, we need to think a little bit more about the conditions under which that uh, collection is happening such that it could enable greater amounts mm -hmm. of uh, autonomy rather than disable. And that's a collection issue, not a use issue? It's gonna be both because, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, one of the, you know, I think the collection use dichotomy is one where that's gonna keep changing because what data is relevant now is it's a it's a changing <coughs> threshold as we, our algorithmic sophistication. This is um, where technology is going to be really important in the next three to five years because we're laying down this global identity infrastructure, and if you want to have a real nightmare scenario, it's where you everybody has one biometrically enabled identity, and everything you do is linked to that. India is now in the process of deploying biometric IDs to every person in India. They're up to 300 million. I think they're gonna be 600 million by the end of the year. And a lot of people think they're doing it the wrong way because they are trying to make sure that this will be used for almost everything you do. Uh, that's not necessary, but certainly governments and companies can find benefits to having that. And so this, this is an issue that's not getting enough attention. In the US, we've been debating what identity should look like for about five or six years. There's something called NSTIC, national strategy for trusted identity. They really haven't figured this out. They haven't figured out how to give people better identity so we can get rid of some of the identity theft while at the same time leaving this space for the activities that people want to keep truly private. Well, and then China's rolled out the uh, development of uh, a rating system for citizens. So, you know, yes. and is, is basically, you know, 
it's a dossier times a million in, in terms of, you know, this, this is your, your rating based on everything you've done online and kind of all the data that's collected about you. It's like is, your Uber rating it's your, plus. It's, it's your, <laughs> all, all, yeah, yeah, your political rating, your, your everything rating, and this is going to affect what schools you get into, what jobs you get, whether you get a passport, you know. You know, still one of the, you know, one of, one of the, uh, one of the kind of like ever um, interesting aspects of these issues is that the usual dichotomy of like dictatorships and authoritarian governments are over here and democracies are over there is constantly being subverted, right? We have all sorts of democracies um, with sort of different values and approaches. One, still one of my favorite examples around privacy is, um, it was about, it, it, about eight years ago, so it's kind of an old example, but the um, Korean government announced a package of privacy initiatives. They said this is gonna be like our big privacy push um, to try to secure Koreans' <laughs> privacy. One of them was we we're going to require uh, all Korean citizens to log on to social network sites using their real yeah. national ID numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And from an American perspective, that's completely insane. That's like, what are you thinking? And their argument was, well, this way people will not violate each other's privacy if their identity has to be known. And then it got hacked. Yeah, of course. I mean, it was <laughs> a catastrophe after that. All right. But Facebook Time does check. the same thing now. <laughs> Facebook, if you opt into it. Uh, Facebook kicked, uh, kicked, name, kicked my issue. pseudonym off when I couldn't prove that I was who I said I was. So, time check, it is um, an hour into this panel. It's 4.45, we have 15 minutes to go, so let's uh, open it to the floor. If anybody would like to jump into the conversation, I'm happy to keep uh, motoring along, but let's see if um, there are some detours we, we should take. Moselle. Oh, oh, oh no, 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 no. Yes, <laughs> Moselle. Ladies and gentlemen, Moselle Thompson. Uh, just two things, one an observation, and one is a question. The observation is, even the one thing that's not in this mix, in we talk about trade, but we also talk about competition policy, which also has a substantial impact to what the outcome of the data is going to be, and you're going to see that play a more important role in the future. That's one. That's the observation. The question is this. After 9-11 and Charlie Hebdo and everything else, I am struck by the fact that there's still not a vibrant public conversation in the US or in Europe or anywhere else about what public expectation should be about data. Do you think that's ever going to come and what will it take? All right, who wants to tackle that? Nula. You don't no. think there's a vibrant conversation? Come on, you say. and I alone make it a vibrant conversation, Mazel. Come on. Um, I'm so glad you asked that question because uh, I, I, first of all, I wanted to respond a little bit to the last question as well about post-Snowden, post-9-11 surveillance. And there actually is evidence. We've been very lucky to do some work with the Pew Internet Life um, Research Team. And although the numbers are not staggering, people were somewhat disappointed, actually, that it was something on the order of 18% of Americans had modified a search or used different words or not used a particular word online post-Snowden. That's a heck of a lot of people, people. 18 yeah. percent of the United States, you know. It's only 50 age, million people. I, you know, I, I don't, uh, math's not my strong suit, but I think it's a big number. Um, and so I would say there is a real effect. And, and, yeah. and I would also say, this is where I get to pontificate on my, my bifurcation between corporate data collection and government data collection. The government can put me in jail. The government can deprive me of rights and liberties. There is a difference to the government collecting the data than to a company with which I do business and have chosen to do business. I still call on them to have a high standard for transparency and accountability and, and a, a free-flowing dialogue about who I am and what I know. We didn't fully answer the question about Amazon. How, hold on, though. How does that dichotomy matter if the government can get the data from the corporations? Well, and that's, what, that's the fight that we are fighting at CDT okay. right now, right, which is to keep those data sets separate without you know, very stringent due process and, and, and a law enforcement predicate. I'm happy to say we got, what, 338 votes on USA Freedom yesterday, so on to the sun, Senate uh, next week. But um, that's a you know step in the right direction. Not not everything we wanted, but certainly step in the right direction. I think there is a vibrant debate. I think there's increasingly a vibrant debate, and I think that you know much is made of the differences age-wise in this country about what young people do online, and they're all over the place, and they give all this personal data. I think there actually are very high expectations among internet kind of. Um, 
what do we call the difference, digital immigrants versus digital natives, I think that the use of ephemeral technologies, the use of you know, self-exploding, self-destructing emails, and, and, uh, and the use of more private circles of, of chat and, and communication show that people do want a safe space online. They do want their privacy, they want, and they want the technology to undergird that and to validate that desire. So I think we will continue this dialogue, but I also was just, as a personal note, I've become an ardent free speech person since I joined CDT, which is not what people expected having worked in privacy my entire career. And I'm very, very concerned about not just the post-Charlie Hebdo world, but also the attacks on Sony, as frivolous as they seem to all of us, and as much fun as we had about the emails. It this was, was an attack, it was fun, and probably more for Continue. US Coast people who knew some of the people involved, but that was an attack on speech as well. My speech, my ability to go see a dumb movie in a movie theater at Christmas. That is my op opportunity to exercise my free speech, the creator's speech as well. And to attack that is an attack on speech and it and is a form of terrorism. And I could go on and on about that as so, well. And Ms. Let me argue with let me argue with your first point. Okay. All right. <laughs> Nula <laughs> argues with <laughs> So so you raised you raised the question of competition uh, enforcement, competition policy. And what I think is interesting in the big data world, right, is um, a couple of years ago, um, I think there was this assumption that you know, Facebook, Google, and maybe a handful of other companies would run into competition flack for the amount of data that they were gathering. In other words, that they could be considered a dominant uh, uh, market actor on the virt uh, by virtue of the amount, the thoroughness, the richness um, of the data that they have about individuals, that just nobody could compete. And in fact, to me, it's very interesting that, uh, again, a couple years ago, there was this sense that like Facebook has just nailed social. They're just the social utility, and anything that's going to be social is going to be built off of Facebook. What we see now, actually, is a fascinating shift in the center of gravity away from social networks and towards communications tools. So if you add up the big social networks right now, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, uh, you know, Instagram. Before Instagram, they're at about two billion. Uh, total users, there's probably some duplication in there anyway, but if you add them up, it gets you to about two million. If you look at the big four communications, which are WeChat, WhatsApp, um, Facebook Messenger, Facebook company, uh, and uh, Skype. Skype, they're now um, uh, uh, right about the middle of this year will exceed the number of users of social networks. And they're building uh, social graphs off of people's phone contacts, not plugging into the Facebook API. So there's a fully independent web of social graphs um, that are independent of Facebook. So anyway, this is one of those areas where I guess maybe we should be sort of concerned from a competition standpoint about whether the aggregation of power that comes along with the aggregation of data is going to suppress market competition. But I don't see it from where I sit. I mean, I make little mobile apps that sort of feed on one or the other of these things. And in no way do I fear um, uh, 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 Google or Facebook in that sense. The one area where maybe I do fear them is their ability to do uh, uh, ad targeting at a level of precision that's impossible to counter, but honestly, um, I'm not even too worried about that because there's so many other, there's evidence that so much uh, ad effectiveness is coming from things other than ad targeting these days. But, um, but, it's important, but it's not monolithically held in the hands of a, a couple of But companies. what's really interesting is to watch what's. about government barriers to entry, and you're seeing that around the world. Yes, sure. Oh, now that's another yes. competition point, right? The yeah. use of. Policy as a trade bureau. data national yes. data, data protectionism. Yes. Yes. But, but okay. I think we're we, all, all right. So we, I can't we, argue we need, with that. <laughs> we need to look at what's being said in Europe. I mean, I spent a lot of my time looking at what's happening there, and we, we do see some really dumb ideas coming out of <laughs> Europe. One of them being the data tax, which is still floating around. I see Andy Wyckoff nodding his head. <laughs> Apparently, it sounds better in French than it does in English. Everything sounds better. Uh, there's also something called the right to the silence of the chips which oh, is yeah. the, the right to somehow know that your little sensor in your tennis shoe or on your sweater is disabled. There has to be a way to make sure that every single thing in the Internet of Things can be disabled by the consumer. But I think the, uh, the most worrisome thing, and we saw this in some of the me internal memos that got leaked in Brussels in February and March as they were laying the foundation for their digital single market strategy. If you read some of these memos, there was this this refrain of, we are about to be victims of American companies. We are going to be totally dependent upon all these platforms. They had a list of, I think, was it 16? Or I think it was 36 companies. Only Spotify was, was European. All these companies that 
European company, European consumers were dependent upon. And I, I really, I see this, this growing sense of, of, yeah, there's of just us a, versus them. There's just a, a big uh, conference called DLD, which is run by the Borda Media uh, conglomerate um, that does a, a version here in New York. And there was a Bavarian state minister that got up and gave this like painfully humorless um, sort of speech about, and, and the fundamental message was, uh, we do not accept American dominance. Uh, we do things different in Europe. Uh, we are willing to um, forego uh, claimed, but we think ephemeral benefits of unfettered data collection. And if you want to do business in Europe, you're going to have to learn to do it our way. I actually am pretty sympathetic to that. I got to say, tonally, as a practical matter, the way that it plays out, um, I think is pretty. Uh, is pretty. But that's more David German. That's more German than than the rest of Europe, because yeah. what you have is you've got the you got the German commissioner, Mr. Odinger, who says that, and then you've got the Estonian. Vice President, who also deals with these issues, who's talking Saying totally something different. Else. That's right. David Kirkpatrick. Thanks. Um, and I, I stepped out for a minute. And if this came up, I apologize. I doubt if it did, though. I, I'm curious, particularly uh, from Newell and Rebecca, on for those people who really are strongly advocating privacy as a general principle, I'm curious how interested you are in or why, I guess the question is, why is there not any discussion in that community about what seems to me to be one of the overarching issues surrounding privacy right now, which is that terrorism is the justification for a vast percentage of the turning of the screw that we're in the midst of, and yet in reality, despite the alarmism and the excitability of the press and everything, terrorism is not that big of a threat to Americans. Does that engage any of you? Sure, okay. absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a real concern. I think we did touch on it briefly, perhaps when you had stepped out, um, about sort of anti-terrorism laws being passed as a justification for more access to user data, and also holding internet companies responsible for their users' activities, um, and sort of increasing liability being placed on internet companies because of terrorist activities. And yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, uh, it, certainly in the human rights community, which is what I'm most connected to, and, and, and you know, people who are using the internet around the world, I can list you know, on all fingers and all toes, the, the, the number of governments who are going after journalists and political opponents using anti-terror laws to go after people who are doing things that nobody in this room would define as terrorism. And it's very alarming when you see democratic governments kind of wanting to enact sweeping anti-terror laws that, that actually in a lot of other countries, like Ethiopia and so on, already kind of give the government an excuse to do whatever it wants. Obviously, the judicial systems and everything are different, but when, when you start putting these things in place, it sort of gives a blanket, blank check um, to governments around the world to demand whatever they want of companies. Um, and they're not going to just go after terrorists um, if you don't have mechanisms to hold them accountable, which these types of laws don't. So I hate to quibble with both of the premises of your question, but I have to. Um, first of all, the post-Snowden era is the reason I am in advocacy. It is the number one issue that CDT is working on right now is limiting government surveillance, limiting the collection of bulk data by the US government and continuing that fight around the world. So I would argue actually that it's the, the, the single most important issue for the digital civil rights community that I'm a part of in Washington, DC. And increasingly around the world, we are looking at improving the standards globally, not just here in the United States. Um, but I would also quibble with the premise that terrorism is not a threat in this country. It is. I worked at the Department of Homeland Security. I was the first chief privacy officer under Tom Ridge. There are people who want to kill us. I said that in my speech at TechProm a year ago. People were shocked that anybody in advocacy would both admit that and then also say, and that alone is not enough, actually, to engage in the bulk surveillance of our citizens. This, the programs that in place have not been proven effective. It's sloppy law enforcement. It's lazy national security systems. Simply because the technology exists to do it doesn't mean we should. It means we should try to keep our citizens safe. I do want my children to grow up in a safe world, but I do not want them to grow up in a world where all of their thoughts are shared with the federal government. If I can just share, Louis Law 
Gilman Louie was the first head of InQtel, which was the CIA's venture capital arm. He spoke at Georgetown about three weeks ago and said something very similar to what you just said, and it, it deserves to be a law. We should not want the U.S. Congress passing laws that we would not want a hundred other countries imposing on our citizens and our companies. And that's true whether it's cybersecurity requirements, whether it's information sharing, whether it's anti-terrorism laws. I mean, we, 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 we tend to think we're the exceptional nation. And so we pass these exceptional laws. And then we're shocked when other countries pass very similar legislation and use them in very perverse yeah. ways. All right, we're going to end on that note. Heavy. Just because you can do it doesn't make it right. <laughs> um, I think that is sort of the lesson. Let me uh, say thank you very much to the panelists, and thank you all for enduring the panel. Thank you.